The Volvo Ocean Race is the ultimate challenge in offshore sailing. A nine-month, ten-leg test of courage and commitment. And it's about to enter new waters. Leg two from Cape Town to Cochin takes the eight-boat fleet across the Indian Ocean for the very first time. Pirates off Somalia are among the potential threats, but the boats are mugged long before they get there. Two days out of Cape Town, sudden squalls and heavy seas exact a high price. Green Dragon breaks its boom, snapped like matchwood in a 50 knot squall. It's going to be a long way to India without a boom. Ian Walker's men sail on, jury rigged and fearful. Ken Reed's crew on Puma's Il Mostro crash lands twice off massive waves, cracking the boat's spine at the bow and keel. You can equate this to somebody breaking their back. Our boat's back is broken. Team Russia is more lucky, surviving a major knockdown without significant damage. Andreas Hanekamp's crew are left scrambling up the deck to get their race back on an even keel. Bauer Becking's boys on Telefonica Blue are also under the weather, lying down when not throwing up. With hours of sail repair in front of them, they find sea life in their water maker. There are animals, like uh, small crabs and stuff like that. Look at that, look at them. Race leader Ericsson 4 and sister boat Ericsson 3 have so far stayed out of trouble, but how long can they ride their luck? Carnage behind them, question marks in front. Leg 2 is taking a heavy toll if not the road to ruin. It's so far been the highway to hell. Leg two, day five, and the fleet continues to surge eastwards in 30 knots of southwesterly breeze. The first scoring waypoint of the race is the line of longitude at 58 degrees east, and the overall race leaders already have their eyes on the prize. So we're currently a couple of hundred miles away from the scoring gate in leg two, which at the moment is just a line of longitude, which is 58 east. And they'll record that at the Volvo office because they poll our position very regularly. And um, that'll be how they decide the points on this particular scoring game. We're currently neck and neck with our sister ship, the Nordic Boat E3, on who's going to get to that line first and break that line first. So a pretty interesting 12 hours coming up. It's been quite a rough trip through the Southern Ocean, or the north of the Southern Ocean. And uh, any armchair admirals out there or top pundits who said this Volvo race isn't as hard as the previous ones which don't go in the Southern Ocean, uh, they're talking out their hat. For Bauman, Ryan Godfrey and Phil Jameson, a sail change in these conditions is a dangerous and demanding exercise. For life at the extreme, the working environment on the foredeck of Ericsson 4 takes some beating. Luanda's crew is now just a few miles behind their Ericsson colleagues, but the Southern Ocean has left its mark. Magnus Olsen is among those seeking attention from medic Richard Mason. In your incident, and my hand is bad and all my fingers are bad because too much steering and no skin left. Magnus? I know you don't like it, but it make you feel a lot better. Oh. Uh. <laughs> 
or race for the gate under jury rig for the time being goes unresolved. Delta Lloyd have also hit a bump in the road to the alarm of navigator Matt Gregory. Oh. Debut as Kasatka charges eastwards is the campaign's financier Alex Zarepsov, the Russian supermarket magnate, who until two years ago had never set foot on an offshore racing yacht. It's no adventure like this anymore. It's the toughest, it's more interesting, it's the most fascinating event on the planet in terms of adventure. His initiation can hardly have been tougher. Soon after the fleet left Cape Town, self-enjoyment took a back seat to self-preservation. Every five or ten seconds, the squall of water coming from the top, smashing the, you with the 50, 70 kilos of water every time. Zarepsov missed leg one following the death of his mother, and the global financial turmoil of the last few weeks have meant the storms have been gathering in both his professional and personal life. Deck 2 has at least provided one valuable commodity. Time to reflect. Normally in an ordinary life you're always busy, you do a lot of things day by day, and you don't have time to think about past. But I have plenty of time to think about myself. Every 5-10 minutes I think about what I've done 10 years ago, 15 years ago, what kind of people I met, what I felt that moment. It's interesting. You've had a really tough month, so Really, yeah. really tough month. Oh, yeah. Pretty tough six weeks before this leg. And uh, I'm still trying to understand what is more important for me. But it's a good time to be alone with your mind, with your thoughts. You're right. I think our family and our relatives most important thing on the planet. Nothing else. And I become stronger and stronger believer that my kids and my wife and uh, my parents are most important things. It's only become bigger, that feeling. Zarepsov's new colleagues are now the fourth place boat in the dash for the scoring waypoint. One place ahead of them is Green Dragon breathing fire after taking the racing option. We've got 32 miles to the longitude. They've got 50. So we've got 18 miles in hand. So I don't think we can cut the corner, but what we can do is change the stay tools, get a reef in, and drop the spinnaker. We'll be absolutely ready to turn up as we get there. Up ahead, Torben Grail's crew have no such worries and storm over the line of 58 degrees east ahead of their sister ship to claim the maximum four points. It was uh, not an easy ride, but it was a good one for us, so we're pretty happy with it. And uh, now we're cheering for E3 to get the second overall, which will be a very good result for the team as well. Three hours later, their Nordic teammates oblige. <laughs> Very well uh, uh, the last five days in, uh, in that storm. Uh, 
westerly wind. I think the same very well. Uh, perhaps not as good as E4, but almost. And we are very proud of that. And uh, now we are uh, aiming for, uh, of course, uh, India. We, we have a good position here after the scoring game. The worry was because you wanted to do good in the scoring game, so you couldn't go north in time. But I think we managed both in a good way. For the Ericsson boats, the dash to the east is nearly over. The race leaders move to a more northerly heading for the 3,000 mile stretch to Cochin. An albatross, their only immediate companion. Still sailing without a boom, Green Dragon managed to maintain their speed, crossing the line barely two hours behind Ericsson 3. So we've had our problems and uh, we've still managed to salvage a third place at the gate ahead of uh, a lot of the other boats, so that's uh, really good, and just behind the two Ericssons. Now the dilemma, of course, we have to reach up out of here. And uh, well, as you see, we're reaching uh, quite well without a boom. And, uh, heading north. So when that longitude hits 58, we're through. That's our scoring gate, and there will be Kosatka number four. The numbers finally add up to in the Team Russia nav station. Fourth place, best uh, position in the in this race so far for us. Big up, hey? Okay, boys, going through the scoring gate right now. Fourth place, Kosatka. Woohoo! I like it, and we're five. heads north in search of the trade winds. In the first of three groups of boats, Anders Luanda's Ericsson 3 loses first place to sister ship and overall race leader Torben Grail on Ericsson 4. Some 30 miles behind, Ian Walker's Green Dragon is battling Ken Reed's Puma and Bauer Becking's Telefonica Blue for third place. While another 50 miles back, Team Russia, skippered by Andreas Hannekamp, is mixing it with Fernando Ecovari's Telefonica Black and Tuni Bermudeth on Delta Lloyd. Piracy is this bloke turning up on your boat and stealing stuff, and it's terrifying. News that the a Saudi Somalis oil tanker very, very has been hijacked indeed. in the Gulf and of Aden serves to remind so the fleet the of the dangers of boat, sailing too uh, close to the Somali coast. The race leaders, at least, have no immediate concerns. What do you reckon about the pirates coming up? Here they've, uh, they've just taken a big uh, tanker ship. Are you worried about the pirates? Really? They've taken a tanker ship? Yeah, they've taken a... They're holding the crew to hostage. Why would they Nothing. take a smelly Volvo boat when they can take a whole tanker? That's what, that's what I would say. <laughs> they can have my wear the gear. Seventh at the scoring gate after slowing down to repair their structural damage. The crew on Il Mostro have clawed their way back to within sight of Telefonica Blue. They're now within earshot of their skipper too. So the way we work the communication is we have a microphone uh, here, just by the wheel. So I, when I speak, uh, Kenny or KP can hear me in the nav station. And uh, they can also talk to us. So right now, for example, with the Telefonica over there, they're checking on the rad radar and give us some information about the range and bearing. Are we gaining? Are we losing? Are we faster, slower, and so on? And they also check the instruments, like the computers, to see um, our own numbers and compare uh, if we should go uh, board down, for example, you know, or trim the boat a bit differently. And here is Ken, I think. 
And so in this uh, wind strength, this 15 knots, the optimum uh, true wind angle, BMC true wind angle is about 127, and that's just more of a, just uh, an FYI more than anything else. Down here it looks like with this little increase in wind speed, we should consider the board going up. Go for it. Telefonica Blue is relishing the lighter winds and looking to make further gains on the fleet. The boat's chief speed merchant is co-skipper Ike Martinez, who won a gold medal with crewmate Shabby Fernandez in the 49er class at the Athens Olympics. This year they reached the podium again, even after Martinez briefly strayed from his Olympic regimen to marry Barbara a few days before leaving for Beijing. A very busy year. Deciding to get married, then preparing the, the wedding, then diet for the Olympics, then the Olympics, silver medal. I didn't prepare the wedding alone. <laughs> no, it was me. So it was very easy for me. <laughs> Just and, got uh, there. Yeah. The day after we got married was my birthday. The day after the birthday, I was just flying to China with Xavi. So yeah. that was. That was our honeymoon. To China with I have Chavi, a honeymoon with Chavi. With his crew. Even though they spend a lot of time out of home when they're in the Olympic classes, this is different because they go out to the ocean, they spend weeks out there. Um, you don't feel the same. It's more dangerous, so you never really relax. I'm feeling very happy. Eh, Barbara? <laughs> because I can't just do what I want, which is sailing, and then she's waiting for me, so it's, it's perfect. Yeah, I'm able to go to all of those stopovers, so it's not that bad. I'm going to see him <laughs> much more than the last two years, for sure. Martinez is a veteran of the ill-fated Movistar campaign in the last race, and his offshore sailing ambitions are stronger than ever. The Olympics over for another four years, it's a preoccupation he now shares with his wife. He teases me like saying, oh, the first two nights you'll, you'll suddenly wake up, what time is it? Okay, now I'm going to check the position to see where they are. Probably, that's what I tell him I won't, but probably I'll do that. Day nine, and Martinez and his colleagues pursuit of the Ericsson boat slows to a near standstill. No, no, it's broken. Yeah. Wait, completely or? Yeah, completely. At water level? No, no, we need, probably we need to pull it out. It's broken. Not this way. There's been some kind of collision with a submerged object, and one of the dagger boards has come off second base. We shall try to stop as much as possible. You see, we can pull it up. Pull it up. Try to pull it up because we need to pull it down. Okay. Bauman and boat builder Pepe Ribes Pepe, takes charge. I think so. Don't call everyone on deck. Have to go down and cut it completely. Okay, we're going. 
Bowed 45 minutes of racing time. Well, we're not sure if we hit something, because all of a sudden a bit of a panic. Uh, for sure, we knew that we damaged something on the daggerboard, and uh, so then the daggerboard has snapped off. We're losing quite a bit of sideways force now, so we might have to change our tactics a little bit, uh, so just to keep we can sail as fast as possible towards the finish. Delta Lloyd, meanwhile, has its own damage limitation exercise to deal with. In heavy seas, the sail furler breaks loose, creating havoc on the foredeck, and a big headache for bowman Gert Jan Porten. You know, I came off with the furler, and uh, probably the pin went loose, and I uh, was you know, snapping around the bow uh, like a, a fire hose that this, uh, you know, then loose. Uh, we got it under control, we dropped the sail, and I got the sail down below. Uh, after we still the job, it was pretty hard because, as you can see, the, the waves are huge and it's hard to control the boat. Struggling at the rear of the fleet is Fernando Echevarri's crew on Telefonica Black, where damaged sails are again the issue. They then lose further time when dropping a sail goes badly wrong. On Team Russia, Andreas Hanekamp's crew has reached a nautical fork in the and, road. Um, that got me thinking because when you look at the detailed routing for a straight line course, actually it wants you to do that. So a big easterly. With the rest of the fleet approaching the doldrums, Hanekamp's men are over a hundred miles back in seventh place with little chance of improving their position. Unless they take a big gamble by heading east to find what looked like stronger winds. So, but it's a big call, you know, because we'll leave the fleet and invest 100 miles. We shouldn't take a decision because we're desperate and we're panicking and shooting one way. We should take a decision because we think it's the right decision and because it really holds the potential. Well, anyway, we're defending one boat. We're defending one boat and with the potential of winning the fleet. Yeah. And the risk of being the laughing stock. I'm used to being the laughing stock anyway, so I don't care. In order for us to pass the other guys, we have to come up with something. For me, I think we can only gain by being blissfully lucky in this uh, in this area. Because I don't think we are in that area going to outperform the other guys in terms of speed. So we can only count on something that we roll the dice and something that God is shining upon us. This morning the result was that we are going to aim for 15, now we are aiming for 25. It's gone up. Yeah. So it's slower, but good. Let's go. Nice. Thank you. So, despite the skipper's misgivings, Team Russia rolls the dice and breaks east, while the rest of the fleet heads directly for the doldrums. Again, finding the right path through the squalls will be critical. Beyond that will be the myriad fishing boats and unfamiliar waters on the approach to Cochin. Can Green Dragon Q 
Huma and Ericsson 3 stay on the pace. Can Torben Grail's crew hang on to their lead in the doldrums? And will the Russians' roulette pay off? Leg two is fast approaching its conclusion.